Well, I was told my name being up here was my cue to get up and make my way up here. So I'm Jared Allen. In case you didn't know, that's who I am. Um, it's good to be here with you all again this morning. Um, I haven't been here with you all in about a year and a half now. Um, so I'm, I'm glad we could be here. Uh, my wife and my three lovely kids are sitting back there in the back row. Um, I had two people ask me why we were in the back row, and I said I've got three good reasons. Um, I, have, I have three kids in case you don't get that. Um, but let's pray together before we, before we dive into God's Word together. Uh, Heavenly Father, God, I'm, just, I'm thankful for this opportunity to gather together in your name. Lord, where we can come together and we can sing our praises to you. We can, we can remember the, the sacrifice that you, that you made for us. Lord, and I pray that as we open your word, that you might be magnified, that you would be glorified, and that you would be pleased with every word that was said. Um, Lord, I pray that you would take your word and make it effectual, that people might know you more through your word today. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't want to talk about me a lot, but um, I do want you guys to know who I am and kind of, uh, you need to know some of the assumptions I, I, I always approach preparing a sermon with. And these are just things that I, I automatically assume every time, every time I open the Bible and I start preparing a sermon. These are just things that I approach the text with. And I just want to make this abundantly clear. And the first of these is that the Bible is God's inspired word. I don't think most of you would disagree with that or else you probably wouldn't be here to study God's word with me. Okay, but I believe that it is perfect, that, that God inspired every single word that is here. And if we're looking for a reason to listen to it, it's because God, the one who created the universe, he inspired the words that are on, in this book. He inspired them. They are from him. So I always just assume that these are perfect. And if you disagree with that, you might disagree with some of the things I have to say this morning, just so you're aware. But that has a natural ramification. If, I, if we believe that this is God's word, then we believe that gathering together in a place like this, in, in, in a method like this, it's worth our time. So there's a lot, of, a lot of people, even a lot of people who claim to be Christians, who don't believe gathering together like this, studying God's word together, is worth their time. Now, they wouldn't come out and say that, but it's apparent. You look at our culture, even Christians, a lot of, a lot of people who profess to be Christians, don't gather together with other believers to study God's Word. I think it is incredibly important that we do so, and it is worth my time to prepare it, it is worth my time to do that, and it is worth your time to hear it. I also believe that. If, if we believe that this is God's inspired Word to mankind, then it is worth our time. It is valuable. It is worth it. I'm going to move this thing over a little bit. I've given, been given permission to dismantle the stage if I need to, so uh, I don't feel like I can see you all with it over there. And I want to make one more thing clear. Um, every time that I start preparing, I don't, want just, I don't want to just tell you something that you haven't heard before. I don't want it just to be so that you learn something new, because I don't believe that the Bible is a textbook. I don't believe that's the case. I want you to know something new, yes, but I want you to know something new so that you can live differently. I want it to affect the way that you live. My purpose is never just so that you learn something and you're a smarter person when you walk out than you were when you walked in. That's not my intention. My intention is to actually open God's word and let God's word affect your life. That's the purpose. That's why we're here. So the reason I want to tell you that is, again, I, I've heard a lot of preachers. I've heard a lot of preachers. And, and it seems like you get these extremes. On the one side, you get these preachers who, who are very academic in their preaching. And they want you to know every little detail of the original language. They want you to know every little word, and they dissect every preposition. So it's like, well, it could mean this and this. And it's like you're reading a textbook. I don't, I don't, I don't want that to be the case. But at the same time, there are other preachers who are way over here on this side who are all application. And they go so far with the application that they almost forget to teach what the text says. And it, there's, there's no middle ground. So what I would like to do today is I would like to teach you what the text says, and then I would like to tell you why that matters, okay? Why that matters and what effect that has for us here and now. So, now that that's out of the way, okay? This is God's Word. I want you to live differently when you leave than when you came in. Um, one last thing about me, I promise, and this will tie into our sermon a little bit more. Um, a lot of you don't know my, my background, you don't know my personal life. Um, I, I have three brothers. I, I don't have any sisters, I have three brothers. Two older, one younger. I love having brothers. Um, <laughs> I 
I love it with the Slocum family sitting back here. There's so many of them. Oh, boy. But I, I just I love having brothers. Okay, now, for those of you who don't know my brothers, my oldest brother, he was, he was a basketball player in high school. He, he, was, he was pretty good. Um, I always looked up to him as a kid. Of course, he's six years older than me, and I always looked up to him. Like, I wanted to, I wanted to play the way that he played. I wanted to be like my oldest brother on the basketball court. Well, some people would look at him and actually say that, that he wasn't just confident, that he was overconfident, almost arrogant maybe. Um, so, so my brother, my brother is, is in this game. They're playing Craig, okay? His senior year, they're playing Craig, and he steps up to the free throw line to make a couple shots in a close game. And one of his friends on the other team looks at him and says, now don't miss. And he looks back at him and says, I never miss. So he steps up to the free throw line, and you know what happens now, right? You know what's going to happen. I never miss. He steps up the first shot. He shoots in off the back iron and missed. Oh, and he just said, I was so deflated. So then he steps up for his second shot. You think he made that one? <laughs> of course not. Of course not. He misses both these free throws after he tells his opponent, I never miss. And he stepped up with all the confidence in the world, but all the confidence in the world didn't help him here. He still missed both those shots. Uh, I actually asked permission to use an embarrassing story about him yesterday, and he said, yeah, it was also right after that, I stepped out of bounds and caught the ball standing out of bounds right in front of Dennis Dornhofer, who was officiating the game. Um, he said, we went on to lose that game because of me, and I'm still mad about it 19 years later. So um, anyway, I, I thought that that was a great example of overconfidence. And the reason I bring that up is because there is no possible way that you and I can be overconfident in Christ. You cannot be too confident in Christ. There is no way. You can put all of the faith in the world in him, and he's not going to miss. He's going to make it. Okay? Now, let me, let me tell you something. I do not believe in what they call the prosperity gospel. You know, you name it, you claim it, you just believe enough, and you're going to have all the riches, you're going to have the nicest car, you're going to have the biggest house, your health is going to be perfect like that. And that's important. That's important. I actually talked to uh, a lady who is a professing Jew. Um, she, is, she is Jewish. I was talking with her, and she said, I have a Christian friend who told me that if I just placed my faith in Jesus, I would get up and walk out of my wheelchair. And I thought, I, I, I don't... I don't see that. I don't see that on the pages of Scripture. Actually, you see quite the opposite, don't you? You see those people who are the closest followers of Christ. They have trials in this life. They have hardship in, the, in life. And before you get too down, just hang on. It's going to get better, I promise. But listen, I don't necessarily believe that it's, it's one of those things. If you just pray hard enough and you believe hard enough, God's going to take all the trials out of your life like that. I don't believe that's the case. But what I do believe is that we can have confidence that whether or not you miss that free throw, whether or not when you step up and that thing doesn't turn around and go your way, in the end, at the end of the game, as a Christian, we still win. So we can have confidence knowing that it's not about your performance. That's not what the Christian walk is about. It has nothing to do with your performance. In the end, Jesus wins. He wins. Okay, I hope you get excited about that. I hope that's something that's good news for you. So even if things don't necessarily work out exactly like you would like, you can still have confidence in those trials, in those hard times, whenever you have that challenge in front of you, when that thing isn't going your way, you can still have confidence. And the reason I say he doesn't necessarily deliver us through all those things, I've been preaching through Jonah with the with the church I'm pastoring right now. And one of the things I had to realize was God didn't necessarily deliver Jonah from the fish. Now, I know it, he does end up spitting Jonah up on the shore. I, I know that. But doesn't he deliver Jonah through the fish? It's not like Jonah instantly starts praying and right away the fish spits him up. It was three days. Jonah was there for three days. God delivered him through the fish. So perhaps the trial that you're in right now, God is delivering you through, not from. Okay, I hope you're following here. So, as I was contemplating which text to preach with you all this morning, I actually asked 
Steve, um, which passage was preached last week, and I was told it was from Romans 8 through verse 29. Well, I would like to pick up in Romans 8, verse 31. So if you have a copy of God's Word, I would encourage you to open it up to Romans chapter 8. We'll be picking up in verse 31. And I've got this thing, but I'm, I'm going to lose track of where I'm at. So if you could help me out, I'd appreciate it. Romans 8, verse 31. And if y'all would stand with me um, while we read God's Word, I, I believe we stand in honor of reading God's Word. So if y'all would stand with me, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31, reads like this. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank God for his word. You may be seated. So the picture that Paul paints here isn't always a pretty one, is it? I mean, you just look at those long lists, and those things don't sound like fun, do they? You know, he goes through all of these trials that people are going to face. But he also seems to have a confidence, a confidence in them. So today what I would like to suggest to you is that that here, Paul is giving us reasons to be confident. And I found four reasons that we can be confident in trials. So first, we can be confident in trials because God is for us. You can be confident in the trials of life because God is for you. Verse 31, I know we just read it, but I think it's worth reading again. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? I actually love the way that Paul writes this here. Um, You may not have picked up on this, but he's actually using a philosophical method. Okay, some of you are thinking philosophy. I don't care about philosophy. I don't want to know anything about philosophy. I can't blame you. A lot of it kind of goes over my head. But you can tell the way he's asking questions, he is cause, he's trying to get people to think. He says, think about this for just a minute. And he starts asking these probing questions to get people to open up their minds, his audience to open up their minds. So he asks seven different questions. At least I counted in my translation, there are seven question marks throughout this. Seven places he has asked a question. He asks what once, who four times. He asks how once, and he says, can these things So he goes through and he begins to ask these questions, trying to get people to open up their minds. And what he's really doing is trying to help them to build their confidence in who Christ is and the work he's done. So he starts asking. He says, says, who, or he says, what then can we say about these things? The question is, what are these things? He says, what can we say about these things? But what things is he talking about? Well, he goes on to give us lists of things. He's talking about these trials, these temptations, these hardships. What can we say about them? What are we supposed to say about those? He says, if God is for us, then who is against us? You're in trials. What can we say about these trials that you are inevitably going to face? What can you say about those? If God is for us, then who is against us? And then I love verse 32 because verse 32, he goes on and he shows us just how for us God is. He shows just how for you God is. Verse 32 says, He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. He didn't hold anything back. Nothing was too much. Okay, I actually had to place this in my own context. I know that's dangerous whenever you try and compare yourself to God. I I, I recognize that. But I want to just say, I have three kids, and I love my kids, and I love my kids so much. I don't think that there is anything that I would give my kids up for. 
I love my kids. Man, God gave his son for you. Boy, that should inspire some confidence, shouldn't it? The God, okay, this isn't just, this isn't just some God, some random idea, some concept. This is God, the one who created, created everything in existence, spoke the world into existence, formed mankind out of dust. That same God, the God that has that kind of authority, is so for you that he was willing to give up his own son. Man, I hope that hasn't lost its effect on you. I really hope that hasn't lost the the wonder that you have. God sacrificed his own son for you. He didn't hold anything back. So I was at at my men's Bible study. We have a group of, I don't know, five to ten men who get together every Monday night. And we were together and we were talking about the cost of discipleship. And the question naturally came up for us. It just came through our discussions. How much is too much? How much is too much? I thought that was a fair question. And really what I was asking was, what are you willing to give up to follow Christ? I mean, how much is too much? And I know that if I went around the room right now, and it, most of you would give me the Sunday school answer, and that's fair. You'd say there's nothing that's too much. But Jesus actually asked his followers to count the cost. To actually think about it. Like, is it worth it to you to follow Jesus? Is it worth it? How much is too much? Because on the other end, when God looks at us, there's nothing that's too much. Absolutely nothing was off limits for God to come to you. Nothing was too much. He held absolutely nothing back. And whenever it says that God offered his own son, the word in the Greek here, and I don't want to spend too much in the Greek, but the word is paradokin. And this word, literally translated, means to hand over, to deliver, to betray, or put to open shame. And that's what God did for you, to show you that he was for you. He literally took his son, not only handed him over, but he betrayed his son. He put him to open shame on your behalf. And he did all that for us. You catch that? That's there in the text. He did not spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. He gave his son, offered him up, delivered Jesus for us. Man, I hope that that inspires some confidence in you as you live your life, as you face trials, as you face hardship, as you face persecution, as you face people on the outside saying, how in the world do you believe that? Well, I believe that because I know a God who is so big that he gave everything for me. And in the end, no matter what someone says or does to me, I know that God, who is bigger than them, is for me. That should inspire a whole lot of confidence. And he did that to take care of your biggest need. I know know that we're needy people. I'm a needy person. I have have struggles of my own. I have hard times with things. Um, I hope I didn't do that. Anyway, people have hard times with things. People struggle. People have have hardships in their lives. That's, That's a fact. But the biggest problem you or anybody else in the history of mankind has faced, the biggest problem you have ever faced is called sin. That is the biggest problem you or I will ever face. So when we come to Christ, when we become Christians, we're saying that we trust Jesus is sufficient to take care of our sin. Right? You're admitting that you can't do it on your own, and you're saying, God, save me from my sin. Right? So you do this. And we're willing to trust God with the biggest problem we have in our life. He handled the biggest question, the biggest struggle, the biggest biggest difficulty you will ever have, how in the world can he not also handle the small problems? Right? You trust him with the biggest thing, and he took care of it. He gave Jesus. He handled it. He took care of the biggest problem we have. How in the world could we not trust him with the small things also? Too many times we say that we trust Jesus with our lives, but then we're unwilling to trust him with our finances. We're unwilling to trust Jesus with uh, our marriages. We're unwilling to trust him with our health. 
That shouldn't be the case, should it? We trust that he was for us and that he saved us from our sin. That's the biggest problem we're ever going to face. How in the world could we not also trust him in the other things too? And he goes on to say, how will he not also, with him, grant us everything? How would he not give us everything? He's going to care for it. If he's going to take care of your biggest problem, he's going to take care of the little problems too. You just have to trust him. Does that mean that he's going to remove you from the struggles? Not always. But you can trust that no matter what happens on the other side of that struggle, Jesus is still alive. He is still the king. He still wins. Trust him. Trust him. So, once again, I don't, I don't know all of you real well. But what I do know is that everyone has a different struggle. So I would, like to, I would just like to ask you to reflect for a minute and just think, just think, what is the struggle you have in your life? What's that trial, that, that burden what is that thing that there is in your life and you just don't know how to handle it? Because they're going to be there. And how you respond to them is really what matters, right? Because we're going to have to respond to them one way or another. Either we're going to respond in faith or we're going to deny Christ in it. And honestly, I love, I love reading through the Psalms. You read through the Psalms and you get these pictures. You, you see how they always start off. They always start off with a trial. Something has come up, especially when you see David. You see David begin to pray. There's these trials that come up in his life, these hardships. And I love reading through them because it seems like they start out, and in, all, in almost all of the Psalms, there's like this turning point where the light bulb comes on, and you see this trial, and then it's turned, but I will serve the Lord, but I will trust God. And I just love these prayers of confidence, and I hope that that can be your song, that you can see the trial, and then you can come to the point where you say, yeah, but God is for me. God is for me. Okay, so first of all, we can be confident in whatever trials you're facing because God is for us. Second, you can be confident in trials because God judges for us. God judges for us. Okay, verse 33 says, Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. All right, so we get this picture here. He begins to use this legal language as he's continuing to ask these probing questions. Okay, He says, who can bring an accusation against us? And he says, accusation there. He says, God is the one who justifies. And if you go to verse 34, he actually uses the word condemn. So we see how we begin to use these, these legal languages here, how Paul begins to write this way. <laughs> and I love this because there's always going to be people who want to, want to point the finger, right? We always have those people. I hope you're not that person. I hope you're not the one who's pointing the finger saying, how dare you do this or that or whatever. I, I hope that's not necessarily you. Instead, I hope we look at people with kindness and compassion, and I hope we love people regardless of their circumstances, because, again, we have the answer to their biggest problem in life. But there's always going to be those people who naturally want to judge you and bring you down and tell you that this is right or wrong or... And a lot of times it's, it's about something that's, that's external. People will look at you and just come up with these ideas about who you are based off of the way that you dress or the way that you look. Or, uh, you know, uh, we're in an age of social media. They'll look at your Instagram account. And they'll instantly think this person is like this. Or they'll look at your Facebook page and think, man, look at this guy. How in the world could you be that guy? Or even worse, we get this tendency where we start looking at people's online profiles on social media and we start comparing ourselves to them and start playing ourselves down. Like, man, I can't meet that standard. I can't do that. And we get this perception that we're almost not worth anything because of somebody else, because of other things around us. Honestly, if you all knew my past, you would probably be wanting to judge me also. And I can't blame you for that. I look at my past and I think, how in the world was I that man? But the problem is that my justification doesn't come from you. Your justification doesn't come from me. We have a God who judges. God is the one who justifies. He is the one who is 
judging us, who is determining whether or not we are right or wrong. But that's God's job, isn't it? It's God's job to determine whether we're right or wrong. And ultimately, God has said that we are all wrong, and without, without the saving grace of Christ, then we're all hopeless, right? But it's God's job to judge. And we see that He judges for us. If you're not sure that He's the one who judges, Acts chapter 10, verse 42 says, He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that He, being Jesus, is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. John chapter 5, verse 27 says, And He has given Him authority to judge because He is the Son of Man. John chapter 5, verse 22 says, Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. So when there's this judgment, when there's this, this idea that you're not worth something, or somebody outside says you aren't good enough, you're not worthy, you aren't, you are trash. When you hear that, all you have to do is remember that they're not the one who makes the final destination or determination. They are just someone else who's going to be judged by the same Creator. Now, ultimately here, Jesus is the judge. But again, Jesus is God. The question comes, who then are you going to try to please? I mean, there's, there's millions of judges out there on the Internet who are out looking around. There's millions of judges walking down the street who are going to make a determination about you the second they see you. Are you going to work to please them, or are you going to work to please the king? And you can have confidence knowing that, that God is the judge. So the question comes, are you going to submit to the Spirit's leading in your life and submit to King Jesus? Okay. We can be confident in trials. Confidence in trials. I'm getting off track again. You can be confident in trials because God's for you. Because God judges for you. Third, you can be confident in trials because Christ intercedes for us. We can be confident because Christ intercedes for us. Verse 34. And this is, this is maybe my favorite verse in this entire passage here. He says, Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Paul's setting up this opposition. Paul's setting up this opposition between condemnation, the condemnation we face, against Jesus. He sets up this opposition, right? So we see this, this, this pairing here. And he says that Jesus died. He starts out by saying Jesus died. In doing this, he actually bore the weight of your condemnation. He bore my condemnation. He, he took my sin. Matthew chapter 8, verse 17 says, This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. Of course, he's referencing back to Isaiah 53, 4. And he's actually building on statements that he made earlier in Romans. He's building on this statement where he shows that we are all guilty of sin and Christ died to take the penalty for that sin. So in Christ's death, as he hung on the cross, he actually bore the weight of my sin. He took that on to himself and he bore that sin. And that's the start. Because he goes on. He says, even more than that, he has been raised. Okay, the story doesn't end at the cross. Now listen, the cross is the central theme because on the cross, Jesus took our sins into himself and he, he paid the penalty for our sins. But the story doesn't stop. And even more than that, he proved that he could defeat death and hell and sin as he was raised from the dead. Now this is fun. Okay, this is the fun part about preaching because now we get to open up and we see Christ has been raised Oh, oh my goodness, I hope you don't lose the excitement at this point. Okay, in all of the world religions that are out there, okay, I, I've been studying a world, world religions, I'm taking a world religions course right now as I'm finishing up my degree. And, and through this, we have looked at all of these different world religions, and none of them, not a single one of them, is as rooted in actual historical events as Christianity. Not a single one has the historicity that Christianity does. And the resurrection 
without the resurrection, do we believe what we believe? I think the answer has to be no, doesn't it? If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead to prove that he had won it, would you believe what you believe? I don't think I would. Not to oversimplify anything. I don't mean to oversimplify anything. But if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead, then you probably won't trust him to save your life either. You probably won't. But the fact is, he was raised. <laughs> Listen, you can give me smart people. You can give me very talented people. You can give me these cool mystical people who can do some amazing things, or even magicians who can do some really cool things. But you can give me any one of those. I'm going to follow the guy who was dead, buried, and in the grave for three days, and then came out of the tomb unscathed. I'm going to follow that guy. Look, say whatever you want. If you have a guy who was literally raised from the dead, I want to know his secret. That's the guy I want to follow. Not the guy who's really smart and can tell me all about astrophysics. That's neat, but I, I don't want to follow that guy. I want to follow the guy who has the answer to death. Listen, even more, he has been raised. He has been raised. And in doing so, he proved that he is the Son of God and is now at the right hand of the Father where he intercedes. And how, why does he intercede? Did you catch that in verse 34? He intercedes for us. <laughs> oh, man, man. I hope this doesn't lose its effect. God, God created everything like we talked about earlier, comes down in the flesh, like as a man, actually takes on flesh. He comes, he lives, he dies for you, and then he comes back from the dead. And this wasn't just kind of dead. This was crucified, tortured on a cross. He was tortured there. He was dead. And then they took a spear and put it in his side to make sure he was dead. Not only that, then they took him, they put him in a tomb, put a big old rock in front of this thing. They sealed it shut, put an armed guard outside of it. And when Jesus is raised from the dead, the guards are over in the corner, curled up in the fetal position, while Jesus is out telling his disciples, I'm alive. Whoo, somebody get excited. Please get excited. Because this is the good news. This is why we are Christians. Because God himself loved us, came as that perfect sacrifice, and did so on your behalf. And then he proved it. Whoo. That's good news. And now he's sitting at this place of honor at God's right hand. And he not only judges, but he's also interceding for us. Okay. This need for intercession, talking with that same, same lady who, who is Jewish, I was, I was speaking with her, and uh, another, another gentleman came and he joined me, and they were actually elders at a, at a Jewish temple. Elders. They were board members at a Jewish temple, excuse me. So they were, they were talking about this, and, and she, said, she said, well, now you know we don't believe in Jesus. I'm like, yeah, I understand the Jewish faith. I, I, I get what's going on. And this gentleman came over, and he was, I felt as if he was a little bit rude and a little bit arrogant, and I wasn't trying to be confrontational, and the gentleman came over, and he said, so basically you believe that Jesus came to, to bridge the gap between you and God because of sin, right? I said, yeah, kind of, that's, that's about right. It, that's pretty simple, but yeah, that's right. And he says, okay, well, basically we don't think there was any need for Jesus because we don't believe we were ever wayward. And I think my jaw might have hit the table. I just, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't understand how you even read through the Old Testament. Read through, the, read through Genesis and don't get the idea that we are in some way wayward. Like we're separated from God because of sin. We need someone to intercede. And that's why they set up this entire priesthood and the sacrificial system. So that you could come and you could be right with God. That's what they did. This idea of intercession, needing somebody to go between us, is all over the pages of Scripture. It's everywhere. I mean, it's on almost every page that we need someone to step in the gap between God and us because of our sins. And Jesus does that. 
It says that he's sitting at the right hand of God to intercede for us. He is bridging that gap between us and God, and that is why he's there. And now we can stand firm because our intercession isn't something temporary or limited or weak or anything like that. Instead, he is alive forever. Jesus is alive, and he is at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. And he proved that he was sufficient through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection. And it is forever. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 says, Therefore, he is also able to save completely those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. He is alive to intercede for us. Just ignore my typo on the screen there. But you can be confident, not because of yourself. It has nothing to do with who you are. If I had to be confident in myself, that's not a lot of confidence. The fact of the matter is we can be confident because of the one who intercedes on our behalf. No matter what's going on in your life, you know that you have a God who is sitting at the right hand of the Father who intercedes for you. I hope that inspires some confidence. So we can be confident because God is for us, because God judges us, and because Christ intercedes for us. Finally, we can be confident in trials because Christ loves us. Because Christ loves us. Verse 35, now this is a long section. 35 through 39 reads like this. It says, Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Two things I want you to understand here. First, Pretty obvious. Absolutely nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. Again, he asks the question, who can separate? And in this passage, he gives us those two long lists. Those two long lists. He gives affliction, which is pressure. He gives distress, which literally translated means narrowness of room. Okay, He's talking about calamity. When things are pressing in on you, can that separate you from the love of Christ? Persecution, hunger, lack of clothing, danger, or sword. Can these things separate you from Christ's love? And then, of course, he gives that emphatic answer. He says, no. And all these things you've been made more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. Those things cannot separate you from Christ's love. And this is something we have a hard time understanding. Just At least I do. Because our love is kind of fickle. It, it, we have this emotional love where a lot of times we're like, yeah, I love this, but then circumstances come in and it's like, I don't love it as much as I used to. You know, I think about certain foods that I was like, man, I love that food. It's not the same thing. That's not what this is. Christ's love is so much different. None of these things will ever cause Christ to stop loving you. Now, he doesn't paint the prettiest picture here. He gives these hardships, all of these, all of these things that are not fun to deal with. Now, please don't hear me say that the Christian life isn't the good life, because I believe it is. But there are challenges. There are real challenges. I mean, it goes so far as to where he is, where he's quoting from Psalm 44, 22 in the Old Testament there. He, he says, as it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Like, people are literally dying because they are following this guy, Jesus. They are literally losing their lives. But the point he's trying to make is that there is nothing that is too much for God. Nothing can take you away from that love. Even death, which we a lot of times, honestly, we a lot of times look at death and we think that's the end. Like, that's the end of our life. Even death cannot separate you from the love that is in Christ. And Paul makes this awesome statement of faith. I love this, his, his statement here. 
I love the way he says this. In verse 38, he says, I'm persuaded, I'm convinced, like I know this to be true, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present. And I hope you can, as you read through that list, that you can feel him, he feel him like, oh man, nothing is going to take me from the love of Christ. There is nothing that's going to do it. I could die, and that doesn't separate me from the love of Christ. Angels could come right now, and they can't convince Christ to stop loving me. There is nothing they can do to make Christ stop loving me. Nothing now or in the future that is going to cause Christ to stop loving me. No powers in the world, nothing high enough, nothing deep enough. There is nothing in all of creation that can take Christ's love from me. Does that inspire confidence? Things may be really hard. Christ still loves you. He still loves you. So the first thing I want you to know as we look at Christ's love here is that, that we need to understand nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. The second thing I want you to understand is that you are actually victorious through his love. Okay, this is important. So if you didn't hear the rest of this, hear this, please. Please, hear this. You are victorious through Christ's love for us. Okay, how sweet is that deal? Right? Like, Jesus came and did all the work because he loved you, and what you have to do is trust him. How awesome is that deal? Whoo, that's a good deal. That is a good deal. He loves you, he loves me, and simply for that reason, we are victorious. Verse 37, there's actually a song that, that, that we all sing about this. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I love this word, more than conquerors, because in the Greek, it's one word, more than conquerors. Okay, it is one word. It actually means to prevail completely, to gain a decisive victory. And I actually like the way Warren Wearsby writes it. He writes that it means that we are super conquerors. We are super conquerors. Like, not just, not just, no, we're not just going to win. We are going to crush the enemy. Like, we destroy him completely. Decisive victory. It's not even close. And how do you gain the victory in these things, in these trials? How do you gain that victory? Because that's really important. How do you gain that victory? Because it's right there in the verse. We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. How do you gain that victory? How do you become a super conqueror? It's through Jesus. <laughs> he did the work and now you can be a super conqueror because of Jesus. It's not through hard work. It's not through doing good things. It's not through knowing enough and being smart enough or checking the right boxes. It has nothing to do with any of those things. It has to do with trusting in Jesus. That's what it is. We can prevail. We can win. We can be super conquerors through him, because of him. And I hope that inspires some confidence. We can be confident because God is for us, because he judges for us, because Christ intercedes for us, and because Christ loves us. Now, I told you I want you to live differently as a result of this word. I want you to live differently. <clears throat> so I have two main points of application for you here. Just two main points. First of all, please, please stop trying to do things on your own. Please stop trying to be good enough on your own. Now, I know that's hard to do, especially when we live in a society that says, if you're not good enough, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, right? Be better. You can do it. Work harder and you'll make it. Listen, I'm not telling people to be lazy. That's not what I'm trying to get at. That's not my intention. The point is, if you're striving to be good enough on your own, you will fail. That's the truth. You will fail if you are striving to be good enough on your own. But we have a God who is for us, who judges for us, who intercedes for us and loves us so much that he has made us victorious. We have a God who has done that for us. It actually makes me think of what Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3. 
where he says, Are you so foolish? After beginning by the Spirit, are you now finishing by the flesh? It's almost like Paul says, Look, you trusted in Jesus for your salvation. You've trusted in Jesus for your salvation. Why in the world are you trying to do the rest of life without him? Why would, why would you do that? That doesn't make sense. God has taken care of your biggest problem. You're like, God, take care of this one big problem over here, and I'll handle the rest. Are you so foolish? Like, what is, why would we do that? We have a God who can defeat death, and we're like, God, I'll handle my finances. I'll, I'll take care of it. Don't worry, I got this. God's like, oh, don't worry, I'll save you from hell. But you know what? I'll, I'll, take, I'll take care of my marriage. You, don't, you stay out of it. How foolish is that? We have a God who loves us so much, who is incredibly for us, so much that he gives his son for us. We have that God. We can know that God because Christ intercedes for us. Why would we not trust him? Why would we not trust him with everything? So my first point of application, please trust that he is still working in and through and for you. Second, I would like to encourage you to tell those who are hurting that there is a way that they can be victorious in their struggles. As Christians, that's our task. It is to take this good news, take this gospel to others. Um, Now please, I'm not trying to tell you to be insensitive to anybody's circumstances. As a matter of fact, please don't be, because then you're going to be like that that lady who's sitting in a wheelchair that says, just trust Jesus and you'll get up and walk. Okay? Listen, don't be insensitive to people's circumstances, but understand that the biggest problem any person on the face of this planet will face is, is their sin. That's the biggest problem they'll face. And we have the answer for that. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 where it says he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. The message of reconciliation, the message of the way that we can be right with God, he has committed it to you and I. Christian, it is our job to tell people that there is a God who loves them so much that he will intercede for them. The question comes, will you be faithful with that message? Will you be faithful with that message? But even further than that, we have the news that will make a person completely victorious in everything. In everything. In trials. We have the message of how you can be victorious in those trials. It's through faith in Christ. Because his love makes us conquerors. So please, please offer physical and emotional and financial help when it's needed. I'm not telling you to ignore those problems. Care for those problems. Be sensitive to those problems. But even more, please don't just treat those symptoms. Treat the bigger disease. Take them to gospel. Tell them that the biggest problem in life is sin. So please, stop trying to do things on your own and tell those people who are hurting that they have a way they can be victorious in their struggles. Let me pray for you all. Heavenly Father, I I thank you for this challenge from your word. God, and I, I... I also thank you for the example that you've given us uh, as Paul gives this statement that that he's convinced that there is absolutely nothing, nothing in heaven or on earth. There is nothing that can separate us from your love. God, and I thank you that you loved me enough that you called me and that you saved me from my sin. Lord, I pray, I pray that you would take this word. I pray that you would take it and you would multiply it, that you would that you would just change hearts and lives, God, that, uh, that you might just take people from a place where they, where they are struggling, where they are wrestling, and, and you might just give them a confidence in you. God, that, you, that their confidence might be so wrapped up in you that nothing, nothing in this life can shake us. Nothing at the end of this life can shake us. God, even the fear of death, God, it, it is nothing compared to knowing you. So Lord, I pray that you would take this word and that you would encourage that you would build people up and that you would give them a newfound confidence in who you are and the work that you've done on our behalf. Lord, I love you and I pray that you would be glorified as as we prepare to leave, God. And I just pray that, that, that you might be the center, not just of our Sunday mornings, but the center of our world. God, I pray that you would be right in the middle of everything. I love you, Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.